I truly love you, Hawk Hogan, brother. This one's for you. Stay strong and look out for all those TNA maniacs. Because you've got to do it for me and you. Jesse Neal, Vinnie Rue, Rampage Jackson, Robert, Robert Roode, Gunnar Murphy, Jay Lee Fool, Samoa Joe, Belly Fool, Sanjay Sada, Siaki, the guy who ropes it smells, smells like. like Marky D. Idiots. They can come in all shapes and sizes. They exist in all walks of life and can be spotted without much hassle. Most people are permanently stupid and have been like this all of their lives. So what if I told you there was a professional wrestler who has dramatically fallen from the intelligence tree and smashed every branch on the way down? A man who started out with a dream like all of us, a dream to be a pro wrestler, but ended up with a dual personality schizophrenic with no teeth, overweight, no friends, no girlfriend, mutilated arms, broken knees and an empty wallet. I'm of course talking about the idiot abyss. Join me as we investigate how this poor man ended up with a brain the size of a pea. Bring up the idiot meter. Dummy! Yeah! And before anyone says it, this is based on both kayfabe and real life Chris Park. I'm trying to hit 10,000 subscribers so please help me out, because YouTube really aren't pushing me like they used to. I know it's been a while since I've done one of these videos, I'm going to focus on this a bit more rather than the Monday Night War series because that seems to have fallen off a bit. Not sure people are sick of that or not anymore, let me know down below. So if you like original content that's not afraid to say something different to what everyone else is saying, make sure you hit subscribe. Things started out quite well for Chris Abyss, as in school he obtained two degrees, and at this time he probably thought that the world was his oyster. He started competing as a pro wrestler, and I'm sure he didn't find work hard to come by due to his 6 foot 10 body. He competed on the first ever TNA show as Justice, and would work sporadically for TNA, before becoming the security for Kid Cash. I guess we all have to start somewhere. Unfortunately, it was his time in TNA which would begin the downward spiral for the monster's IQ, and things would get progressively worse for him as the years went on. This was the start of the downfall of the monster. Although he would do okay for the next few years, each year something did happen to him that showed he wasn't exactly the sharpest knife in the drawer. He had a manager called Goldilocks and she was horrible to him. She would tell Abyss regularly that nobody liked him and that he was hideous. Despite this he kept working for her. He was also a complete idiot because he fell for her and he thought he had a chance with her. She basically just used him to beat up her ex-boyfriend Eric Watts. Goldilocks formed a sort of faction where she would win other wrestlers' contracts through Abyss's wins, and she treated them all like slaves. But Abyss was treated the worst out of all the wrestlers. She regularly made jokes about how fat he was and said he didn't fit into the group. During this time, he was jammed in the back of car boots and wasn't allowed to ride with the rest of the crew. He was made to look like a complete and utter moron every week on TV. Abyss recovered from his humiliations the previous year and beat Jeff Hardy in a full Metal Mayhem match to become the number one contender for the TNA world title. However, he stupidly decided not to cash in his world title shot. Instead, he got roped into a match of AJ Styles with a number one contendership on the line. This was a six sides of steel match and whilst it was an amazing match, Abyss lost and proved that the lights were on but nobody was home. Oh God, have mercy on this poor unfortunate creature. In a crazy move, the 6 foot 10 monster would win the TNA world title for his first and only time. The twist here is that he beat Sting by DQ. We all know the title doesn't normally change hands by DQ. Look, comment down below if you can think of any other times where the world title changed hands by DQ. This is the year that Chris Park also made the biggest mistake of his professional wrestling career, as in 2006, he turned down an opportunity to go to the WWE. They were reportedly lining him up for a main event push and a match against Taker at WrestleMania. But Abyss decided to turn down their invitation, as he had too much loyalty to TNA. I can't even say that with a straight face. And he said that he was enjoying the direction of the company. What a complete buffoon. If only he knew what was in store for him coming up in TNA. I bet he wouldn't have made the same decision. Mama, I'm a criminal. Mama, I'm a criminal. 2007 was a rough year for Abyss. I think this was the true downfall of the monster, and this is the year he lost the most of his IQ. He lost his world title in January, but he never asked anybody for a rematch. Well, that's pretty stupid. I think this was because he was too distracted, as Abyss was being blackmailed by Father James Mitchell into doing his bidding and constantly being beaten up by Sting at the time. James Mitchell was blackmailing him with a secret, and this turned out to be that Abyss's mum had shot Abyss's dad in the back, 
and Abyss took the fall for this and served time in prison. Jesus. As far as wrestling storylines go, I have to draw the line at people being shot and getting blackmailed. James Mitchell threatened to turn his mum in if he didn't behave. Abyss obviously didn't realise he was on a TV show, and everyone knew the secret, so Mitchell didn't really have a leg to stand on, as everybody else knew the secret. Not long after this, Abyss spoke for the first time. This was a massive mistake. It's better to keep your mouth shut and let people think you're a fool than open it and remove all doubt. Things definitely got worse for Abyss from here. Towards the end of the year, Abyss attempted to perform a choke slam on a rat. The rat belonged to Goldust, who at the time was Fat Rain. He wasn't successful in murdering the rat, but people who harm animals are not only dumb, but also dislikable. The year closed out with James Mitchell threatening Abyss once again that he knew another secret about him. It was then revealed that James Mitchell was actually the father of Abyss, which meant that James Mitchell was nine years old when he had young Chris. That was a rough year for Abyss. If he wasn't a moron before, he certainly is now. Abyss checked himself into an insane asylum, I don't blame him, voluntarily though. He was shown on TV for weeks crying in his cell. He then eventually returned to TNA after 4 months with a new look. He now wrestled in an outfit that they made the prisoners of the asylum wear, despite Abyss choosing to go to the asylum, so I guess he wouldn't have been a prisoner? He formed a tag team with Matt Morgan which is never a good idea. It wasn't long before Morgan turned heel on him and put him down with a steel chair. This is a trend you will see in Abyss's career by the way, being so dumb that he trusts the wrong people all the time. He also decided to go ahead with one of the dumbest spots in wrestling that year, as the Dudley boys threw him off the stage into a flaming table. The fire just wouldn't go out and Abyss had to take his mask off to try and put the flames out. Abyss would appear in segments with an unknown counsellor who was obviously Stevie Richards. Stevie was trying to help Abyss overcome his obsession with violence. Well, maybe quitting pro wrestling for a start would help Abyss. They would soon be joined by Daphne so all the crazy people could be in the same faction. The generic blonde backstage interviewer called Lauren became the target of Abyss's affections and he soon started to believe that she was his girlfriend. He started a storyline with Mick Foley where he became his biggest fan and started to dress like Mick Foley. This would not be the last time that Abyss became obsessed with something. Abyss and Foley had the chance to win the tag belts together and Abyss was so excited and was clapping like a seal but Foley turned on Abyss because he thought Abyss had destroyed his little picture. This picture was a dumb cartoon drawing of Jeremy Borash and Mick Foley tweeting, and it was completely worthless. Foley left Abyss in a pool of his own blood over this picture. Abyss was screaming and crying as TNA went off the air that night. He was screaming, why Mick, why? And the audience fell silent. It was awkward. Foley would then go on to call Abyss a cheap imitation, and this caused Abyss to go on a rampage backstage. This was the most infamous year in Abyss's idiocy. This was the year that Hawk Hogan decided Abyss was the future of professional wrestling. He was full of endorsements for the monster Abyss, and he even went as far as giving him his own personal wrestling hall of fame ring. Abyss would become obsessed with this ring and also Hawk Hogan. He truly believed that Hogan's hall of fame ring gave him superpowers, and the ring paired with the Abyssomania showed that Abyss had sunk to new lows. This run was truly abysmal. He was a complete brain dead moron at this point, even little children in the audience pointed and laughed at how dumb he was. He was obsessed with everything Hawk Hogan. He acted like Hawk Hogan, he used his taunts and he used his moves. Abyss would even get new ring gear around this time. It was the same ring gear as he wore before but with random spots of red and yellow on it. It looked more like he'd gone to McDonald's for a Big Mac and spilled the burger sauce down his top. Abyss then started feuding with Desmond Wolfe. During the feud, he'd win the services of Wolf's manager Chelsea for 30 days. After the match where he won Chelsea, the £350 Abyss carried the £90 Chelsea kicking and screaming over his shoulders to the backstage area. It was heavily implied that he raped her, although this was never actually confirmed on TV. Abyss did seem like he was infatuated with her, and she was disgusted and terrified of him. It was quite disturbing to watch. His dumb year would continue, as he started using a trademark weapon called Janice. It was a wooden stick with nails driven into it. However, he couldn't actually use Janice on anyone in TV because if he hit anyone properly they would die, so it wasn't a believable weapon. He would actually hit RVD off screen with Janice, which caused RVD to be so badly hurt he would have to vacate his world title. Abyss would never face any repercussions from the law over this attempted murder. Did any of you actually read of Mice and Men? Abyss is basically Lenny, he's a complete moron who has to be constantly supervised by someone, otherwise he will end up getting in trouble. This was a mixed year for Abyss. He started out decent enough as he won the TV title for the first time. Around this time Abyss would be murdered on television. 
He came out to the ring doing his goofy pose, but he'd eventually drop down to his knees and fall on his face to reveal that a weapon was sticking in his back. It was Janice. This injury was deemed so severe that Abyss was kept off television for two months. During this time, Abyss was stripped of his TV championship as he hadn't defended it. Abyss would return on the next TNA episode, so why bother stripping him in the first place? On his return, Abyss won the X Division title and was showing a new and exciting aspect to his character. Abyss had become obsessed with a book. The Art of War. This was probably the most intelligent Abyss would ever be, as he demonstrated that he could actually read. He'd often quote the book in promos before matches. Abyss would eventually lose the X Division title to Brian Kendrick and would be unable to compete for the title again as he introduced a weight limit and Abyss was too fat. Abyss had ended the previous year feuding with Bully Ray and winning. Well, as of 2012, something strange started happening. Something very, very strange was happening with the monster. It was reported that he was missing and Bully Ray was being accused of doing something to him. We were soon introduced to Joe Park, who represented the law firm of Park, Park and Park. Joe Park said he was looking for his brother Chris. You know, Abyss. Abyss was now doing a schizophrenia gimmick where he thought he was a lawyer and he forgot he was a pro wrestler. He showed great acting ability here and it was really refreshing to see him ditching the Abyss character, which had grown as stale as a three-month-old pizza bread in the fridge. The problem was, the whole storyline was really dumb. It was just another step into the idiotic character development of Abyss. He would eventually challenge Bully Ray to a fight, as he was still searching for his brother, and Bully Ray was the last one who saw him. Unfortunately, he no longer knew how to wrestle, and he would have to go to OVW to learn how to wrestle again. At this point, he'd been a wrestler for 17 years. It was completely dumb. He would turn into Abyss during his matches if he saw blood, and then he would beat up his opponent and turn back into Joseph Park and act surprised at what he'd done. It dragged on all year that Joe Park didn't know he was Abyss, so they were the same person and we all knew it, but Abyss didn't. Problem was, a couple of times Abyss and Joseph Park appeared in the same segment at the same time, insinuating that they were not the same person, although later it was revealed that they were. This was never explained and didn't make any sense. Anyway, didn't anyone ever think to show Abyss a tape to help him realise? He was also kidnapped by the Aces and Eights and held hostage for three weeks, but he didn't lose any weight. During this time, Hawk Hogan didn't seem too bothered about his friend Joe Park and wasn't in much of a rush to help him. He was still using the Joe Park character at this point, but Abyss returned for one night only and beat Devon Dudley to win the TV title for the second time. Abyss would then disappear again and he'd go back to being Joseph Park for the next year. The TV title was not defended. If you want to know more about that, click the link on the screen for my video on the TV title, Just Awful. This would cause Abyss to be stripped of the title for the second time, showing that he's stupid and didn't learn from last time when he didn't defend the TV title and got stripped for it then. During this whole time, Parker continued to turn into Abyss during matches, but still nobody told him or showed him any evidence that the two were one in the same. It had dragged on for such a long point now, it was completely dumb. It was finally revealed to Abyss in February that he and Joseph Park were the same person, after Eric Young ripped his mask off during a match. Abyss would eventually realise he needed help, and disappeared from TNA again for a few months. Man, Abyss loved to take a spring break. Abyss would turn up back in TNA interfering in a match between Magnus and Samoa Joe. He appeared under the ring and helped Magnus regain his world title. It was completely embarrassing and killed the crowd. Abyss now had an ugly new mask on that he looks like he found it from a skip. He was now working for Magnus, but it wasn't long before he was once again betrayed by somebody that he thought was his friend, and the dumb Lummox was sent packing as Magnus kicked him to the curb. Abyss was lying low. He joined James Storm's new faction, The Revolution, which was a group of wrestlers with failed gimmicks, and Storm would try and help to breathe new life into their characters. It didn't work out for Abyss, although he did win the tag belts with James Storm, but that didn't last long either, because him and Storm fell out, as usual. <laughs> Abyss joined Rosemary and Crazy Steve in The Decay. He was unmasked once again during this run, but he did have face paint on. Abyss kept proclaiming that he's beautiful, and this was his new catchphrase. If you ask me, Abyss is completely deluded and brain dead at this point if he thinks he's beautiful. Joe Park returned once again. Nobody wanted to see this character return at this point. He teamed up with the equally stupid Grado, but he was secretly stealing Grado's money the whole time from his wrestling matches. Nobody cared, and it sucked. 
In 2018, Abyss forgave Father James Mitchell for everything he'd put him through and let him be his manager once again. Despite all the stuff that had happened in the past, blackmail, serving time in prison, all the beatings and verbal abuse, Abyss had his head caved in so many times at this point, he probably doesn't retain any sort of memory. So this explains why he trusted Mitchell again. Anyway, Abyss always trusts the wrong person. In 2019, Abyss hung up his wrestling boots, and this signalled the last TNA veteran leaving the company. He joined WWE as a producer and retired from wrestling at the age of 45. By this point, his body was completely shot from all the hardcore matches and dumb spots he'd done throughout his career. If I failed to mention any throughout this video, I'm sorry, there'd be too many to mention, it would be an hour long. A lot of wrestlers can keep going into their 50s, but by the age of 45, Abyss was left crippled and barely able to walk, so good on him for finally doing something smart. And that's it, that's the dumbest wrestler in pro wrestling history. I doubt this will ever be repeated again, because wrestlers are a lot smarter nowadays. If you enjoyed this video, please support me on Patreon, the link's down below. And if you are an Abyss fan, no offence, I respect and like the guy too, but man, he was used in some dumb ways and we have to point a laugh at it sometimes.